Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this, this week's virtual plan clinic. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with the University of Florida IFAS Extension here in Hernando County. And today I'm here all by myself. My regular co-host, Lily Browning, had to go to a special training this morning that she hadn't planned on, but they emailed her at the last minute. And of course, it coincided with our clinic today. So this morning you have just me, and I see Buddy's on here also. Buddy said, good morning early before I even started. Apparently, you can do that on uh, YouTube Live. So I learned something today. But if any of you have any lawn and garden questions or anything you'd like to ask, discuss, kick around, whatever it might be, just go ahead and put them in the comments, and I'll do my best to try to figure it out. Uh, good morning, Monique. How are you? And let me see, there's one thing I wanted to share. This is a question that I got, not yesterday, but the day before, I think. And a lady contacted us and she had a problem with her Arizona cypress. Apparently she has a number of Arizona cypress bushes that make a hedge and one of them is having problems. So let me go ahead and share the pictures that she sent me and here we go okay that seems to be working correctly there is a picture of her arizona cypress this is um it, it can grow into a very large evergreen bush that looks a little bluish green very attractive um and there's what the whole thing looks like and it's a little hard to see that there's really anything wrong with it but if you look at it up close it has a lot of dying leaves and from some of the other pictures she sent a lot of discoloration or um, brown spots or dead spots on some of the smaller branches also so when it comes to evergreen bushes growing here in florida especially central florida they don't do very well here sorry but we have a lot of problems with them we see a lot of questions especially every summer and the reason why is the only evergreen that does really well in central florida is uh southern red cedar because it's native to, to florida there is a couple of other evergreens but arizona cypress doesn't seem to do well long term because if you think about it arizona cypress and this is florida and Florida is very, very, very different from Arizona, these bushes suffer in high humidity. And here in Florida, what do we have most of the year, not the entire year, but most of the year is very high humidity. During the summer, it rains a lot, it's very humid, it's very hot. So, um, but usually late summer, we'll get a number of phone calls and pictures sent to us about different various evergreens, any kind of evergreen other than a southern red cedar um, die. And sometimes they'll get a root rot and all of a sudden the entire bush will seemingly overnight turn completely brown. The whole thing dies. But what is probably happening here with this Arizona cypress is it has a fungal disease problem. It has a uh, stem canker, which is when you have a fungus that's growing on either the small stems or the larger stems and it's damaging the surface of the stem. You have a big dead spot in it now. What that does is damages the stem, so everything down, downhill from that spot turns brown. Not a whole lot you can do in this situation. Yeah, you could use a fungicide, but if you, you know, remember what the um, full bush looks like here, Spraying a bush like that is just not practical. You're going to end up getting more on yourself than you're going to get on the bush. You can, with any kind of evergreen, if you have some dieback or some dead branches, go through and very carefully prune out the dead branches and dead growth and hope for the best. Make sure that you clean your clippers frequently because you don't want to be spreading the disease. But that's really about all you can do with uh, Arizona cypress. Like I said, we get quite a few questions about that. Let's see, Amy is asking, how do we get rid of stinkweed? And 
Stinkweed is a very, very common name. That could mean a lot of different plants. If by chance you're talking about skunk vine, which you might be, that's an invasive vine that gets in people's lawns, believe it or not. And if you have it growing in your lawn, it's pretty easy to kill with an herbicide because skunk vine is a broadleaf plant and your grass is a grass. They're different. You can get something to kill one without killing the other. <clears throat> but if you have skunk vine that's growing up, like I have a row of hedges out in the front of my house, I have a lot of skunk vine in it. All you can do is go out there and pull it up. Because if you have any kind of invasive plant or weed or something growing where you don't want it, if it's physically separate from other plants that you want to keep, you can use an herbicide to kill it. But if it's intertwined right next to it, mixed in with it, a lot of times there is nothing available that's going to kill A without killing B. So if you're trying to kill skunk vine without killing your lawn, that's possible because they're technically different types of plants. Let's say you have skunk vine growing in a row of hedges. You can't, if you spray the row of hedges, you'll kill the hedges along with the skunk vine. And that's probably not what you want to do. That's not going to get you closer to your goal. So, Amy, if you could be a little bit more specific about what stink weed is. Now, in your lawn and flower beds, there's all kinds of weeds out there right now. We still have the, um, the last of the winter weeds and all the spring and summertime weeds all coming up. So this is kind of the best time of year for varieties of weeds in your yard. My front lawn has all kinds of weeds coming up in it. And yeah, a lot of them stink. If you go out there and start physically pulling them up, you know, they make your hands all stinky. Other ones are um, sticky, like oily. So we have all kinds of weeds out there right now. All depends on where they're growing and what your eventual goal is about what you're trying to accomplish. Lee, good morning. How are you? So nice that you could join us this week. And Cindy, good morning from Pinellas County. And Teresa, our office assistant, is tuning in today. And she put a link up there for everybody to see and click on from a University of Florida publication. And I'm not positive what that one is, but maybe it's on skunk vine. It's, I'm sure it's on something that we've already discussed. Um, so if you have any questions at all, if you have any pictures from a problem plant or bush or palm tree, I think I've gotten them all this week. Um, feel free to email it to me and I can go ahead and share your picture. Let me go ahead and toss my email address up there. So another question I got just this morning, just maybe within the last hour or so, a lady called and she has a problem. She has cats. She has 10 cats and she lets the cats out in the yard sometimes. And one of her cats got sick and spread it to another cat, another cat. Now she has several cats that are all sick with giardia and giardia for people who live up north maybe you've heard of something called beaver fever giardia isn't a bacteria it's not a fungus it's a single cell organism and it can live in water and i'm familiar with it being a waterborne pathogen people up north when they go swimming in lakes and rivers sometimes can contract giardia it's a little single cell organism, and if you get it, I guess, up your nose, or you drink contaminated water out of a lake, you can pick it up, and it replicates inside of you and makes you very, very sick. People rarely die of it. There are, if you see a doctor, there are things that they can use to cure you. They're going to put you on a medicine, and this lady that I spoke to, her cats are on medicine or medications right now, but she asked about, can we test the soil for Giardia? I'm thinking, I've never really heard of Giardia being a problem in the soil, although it is present in the soil. And if we go outside right now, even right in front of our office, and we take enough samples from the area, we'll probably find a few cells of it because it's present in the great outdoors. But uh, it's I've never heard of it causing a problem or making a person or a cat or a dog sick from just being in the soil. 
So what probably happened was her cats got in, into either standing water outside. It spread pretty easily through feces. Wild animals, a lot of times in their feces are going to have salmonella. I assume it could contain Giardia also, could contain um, E. coli, a number of other bad things. So always be very, very careful if you end up with um, basically mysterious poo in your yard. Go out there, make sure you wear gloves or, you know, cover your hands very well, pick it up, dispose of it properly, wash up very well afterwards, because wild animal poo contains a lot of really nasty things potentially. I have no idea how her first cat contracted Giardia, but apparently the cats are spreading it from one to the next to the next. Keep in mind, cats use and generally share one cat box, which is going to be an ideal way of sharing that. So that's a question that I've never gotten before. So don't be afraid to ask really unusual questions. If I can't figure it out, I might have to look into it a little bit and get back with you, but um, we'll figure it out eventually. Um, oh. Here's a question from Monique. She says that I need to trim my boxwood, but I'm afraid of the sun scorching them. Should I do it in the evening? As a general rule, if you're trimming something like a boxwood and you're trimming off one third or less of it, because they don't really recommend trimming more than one third of any plant or hedge or bush at one time, that's going to be like a little bit too much and put it into too much shock. There are situations where you can severely prune something. Some plants do just fine. Other ones might not recover at all. But generally, you can trim your boxwood any time of day. Um, you may want to do it in the evening for yourself if it's out in the full sun. It is warm out there. I was out in my yard yesterday at 5 in the afternoon. In the backyard, I get the afternoon west sun. And it was pretty hot out there. So maybe for yourself, you want to do it in the evening. And that's probably not a bad idea. It gives the bush, the, the, the cut branches, a chance to callus over and recover until the next day. After you prune it, you may want to water it or just make sure that it's, it's staying watered with whatever you know kind of irrigation that you're giving it. But if you normally don't irrigate it, you may want to water it after you prune it. And it should be fine. Boxwoods are take very, very well to pruning. Keep in mind, and most people don't really think about this, but when it comes to boxwoods, hedge bushes, a hibiscus, many other things, they don't live forever. So I'll have people contact us and they have problems with a plant or a hedge. And I go, well, how long has it been there? And they'll tell me, well, we bought the house 25 years ago and it came with the house. So many of these plants are only good for maybe 20 years maximum, and that varies a lot. Some, an oak tree might live for much longer than 20 years. A lot of hedge bushes, believe it or not, last 20 years or possibly a bit less. So if you're having problems with hedges, stop for a moment and think, how old is this? How long has it been there? If, it, if you have a viburnum hedge or a boxwood hedge that you've been pruning for 20 years and it was planted, five, 10 years before that, it may just be dying from old age if you start to have problems with it. But Monique, you know, that's a kind of a side point. If your boxwood looks fine uh, and you trim it, it should be fine. They take very, yeah, and you're just, you're, Monique says she's only topping it. So that's good, should be just fine. And Judy asks, the best grass seed for a sloped yard there isn't really any one variety that's better for sloped than non-sloped or any other variety. So you could grow St. Augustine, Bahia, Bermuda, Zoysia. Zoysia is tough. Zoysia has a lot of problems, so be aware of that. Um, <clears throat> the problem is establishing it. So if you want to put down Bahia grass seed on a slope, the first time it rains or you water it, all the seed washes down and ends up in a big pile. And you're going to have one area where you have a million seeds germinate and you're going to have all the little baby grass shoots coming up and other areas where it just washed off of. So a lot of times for a sloped yard, um, putting down sod is going to be a lot 
you have a much better chance of it establishing and doing well. Always be careful to cut it high. Always be careful if you're using a large lawnmower on a slope, they can tilt and now your lawn isn't being cut evenly. It's being cut shorter on one side than the other. So don't scalp it. Scalping a lawn is the quickest way to kill it long-term. And um, either Bahia or St. Augustine is going to establish well from sod. But if you're looking for seed, obviously St. Augustine, there is no seed for St. Augustine. So if you're using seed, that's tough. You want to put it down and just water the area very, very, very lightly and keep it moist until the seed germinates. Because if you water it heavily, or if we get a big rain, all the seed is going to wash down the hill and you're going to have a ton of grass at the bottom of the slope, but the rest of the slope is going to be bare because all the seed you put down washed off. So establishing a lawn from seed, you can do it. It's just tough. It's going to take um, a, a certain amount of um, thought and planning to go into it. And Joseph asked a question here. I think he's asking what kind of grass sends out shoots? So out of the most common lawn turf grasses that you would possibly have, the two, no, the two big ones are Bahia or St. Augustine. St. Augustine does spread by runners, so it sends out shoots along the surface of your lawn and can spread that way. Bahia doesn't send out shoots. A very, very old Bahia lawn will start to send out kind of thick shoots, but it has to be an old lawn. So chances are, if you have, if you go, if you're looking at your lawn trying to figure out, well, what kind of grass do I have? It could very well be St. Augustine that does send out runners and shoots and spreads that way. And Judy follows up with the um, turf grass seed question that she says it's sparse Bahia now. Yeah, Bahia over time can get sparse and thin. If you lived out in the country and you had a pasture and you had horses, you'd probably grow Bahia grass out there. And you seed the field, you'd have to make sure it rains because they generally, it's very, very difficult to, to water 10 acres while your Bahia grass seed is germinating. And you're going to have Bahia grass growing out there. Your horses are going to eat it. And it's going to grow, but you don't run a lawnmower over it. So the Bahia will send up those seed heads that everybody hates for some reason. The tall seed heads with a little three, three shoots off of it. And it's going to make seeds. And horses eat them. And then horses poop the seeds back out. The Bahia is allowed to grow longer than what you're going to let it grow in your neighborhood. And set seed. And you're always adding to the lawn. You're always reseeding a little bit every summer to the lawn and it's, it's looking okay for a homeowner bahia lawn over time they get thin because when it grows a little bit what do you do you break off the lawnmower and you cut it grows a bit you cut it grows a bit you cut it people hate those seed heads when they start sending up seed heads it's like oh no i need to go out there and cut it today because i hate those seed heads so something very important you could do for anybody who has a bahia lawn I know it's a little expensive nowadays, but you go out and get a bag of Bahia seed. And during the summer, during the rainy season, when it's raining on a fairly regular basis, go out there and throw some Bahia seed out and keep doing that. And bit by bit, you're always going to be making your lawn a little bit thicker. Otherwise, if you do nothing but cut it, it's always going to be working on getting a little bit thinner. So by seeding a little bit casually during the summer, when it's naturally raining, um, not all the seed will come up, but every time you throw some seed out there, some will come up, and every little bit is going to help to add to the behavior that you have growing. Tip number two is behavior grass. A lot of people love to set their lawnmowers really short to cut that, and if you have a service or a person you're paying to cut your lawn, they definitely cut behavior really short. Don't do that. Cut behavior at least three inches high. Cut it. As a matter of fact, don't be afraid to whatever lawnmower you have, set it on the highest setting. 
And if you always cut your behea at that setting, it's going to be healthier and you're going to have a lot more actual behea grass long term. One of the easiest and best things you could do for your lawn. So between cutting it high, throwing down some extra seed during the summer when it's raining, you're going to always be um, adding to your behea lawn, not really subtracting from it. And long term, it's going to help. And Judy says she's skipping mowing now to allow the seeds uh, to try, to try to germinate. Yeah, that helps. Um, I don't really want to say that mowing less is better than mowing more often. Only mowing when you need to is the best way to go. So don't be in a rush to go out there and cut your lawn or cut it really short. The problem is if you just kind of blow off cutting the lawn during the summer for a month and now it's really it's like pushing knee high when you do go out there and cut it you're cutting a lot of it off and that's really damaging for your lawn also but judy says that she doesn't use any weed and feed or bug and feed that's good the bag dry granular weed and feed does not work well in florida and that goes for Bahia weed and feed. It goes for St. Augustine weed and feed. Because here in Florida, you control the weeds in late winter and you don't start feeding it or fertilizing it until now in the spring. This is, uh, it's May 12th today. <clears throat> you really don't have to rush out there and push the first fertilization. If you go out there and fertilize your lawn for the first time now, that's fine. Most people and all services over fertilize lawns. Your lawn probably doesn't need as much fertilizer as your service has been putting on it. So um, not using weed and feed is very, very good. We don't recommend it. And not using any kind of insecticide unless you absolutely need it is very good also. And Judy says she'll kick it up a notch. So um, who was it, Emerald? said, you know, kick it up a notch. I think we need to adopt that saying. We need to do something with that. I hope it's not trademarked. I hope I don't get in trouble for saying that. But yeah, when it comes to cutting your lawn, you need to kick it up a notch. And cutting it higher will never hurt your grass. Cutting it shorter can hurt your grass. Cutting it way too short a bunch of times in a row will almost guarantee that you're going to kill your lawn. So keep all that in mind. And we have an interesting question here from BB, and this is something that um, came up with somebody. I can't remember exactly who. Oh, um, somebody who came to visit our Master Gardener Nursery has did, and they live in Polk County. They redid their lawn and had a resodded in a new variety of St. Augustine grasses called Citra Blue. And BB Camillo is asking, is Citra Blue St. Augustine, any more drought tolerant than Floritam. My six-year-old Floritam is struggling, especially bordering the sidewalks and driveway and the strip between the street and sidewalk. Yes, I believe the Citra Blue is more drought tolerant than Floritam. I know during the dry season, you don't want to overwater it. Overwatering Citra Blue is going to I don't really want to say damaging. It's not really good for it. So like right now is a really dry time of year. People with Citra Blue, if they overwater it, thinking that's going to help it and make it green and make it grow faster, it's going to look great. It usually knocks the grass back and inhibits it and damages it a bit. So Citra Blue is going to be a bit more drought tolerant than Floritam. It is a bit more tolerant to take all root rot although not completely immune to it and citra blue believe it or not i've been told that it's a very attractive grass if you look at it just right <clears throat> it does appear to be a little bit bluish green and i believe it grows it's naturally grows a bit slower than floritam so during the summer if we get that magical three rains a week if you have Floritam, it can grow like crazy so that you're having to go out there and cut it every four days. And people get in this 
bad routine of, oh my gosh, my floor team is growing really fast. I'd have to cut every four days. I know I'll go out there and cut it extra short so I don't have to cut it for seven days. And eh, wrong step, wrong thing to do. That will start damaging your lawn in the long run. The thing that you have to do if you have floor tam and it's growing like crazy, sorry, you got to cut it more often. Cut it really, really high, and you will be rewarded with a healthy, good looking lawn. Anything other than that, and you will be long term rewarded with a lawn that has a lot of weeds, has a lot of dead spots, now is more attracted to chinch bugs, contracts, take all root rot. Because what is the worst thing for take all root rot? Cutting it too short. So don't cut it too short. Cut it really high. But yeah, I believe the Citra Blue St. Augustine is at least a little bit more drought tolerant than Floritam. It will still need to be irrigated, but less. So Facebook user, and this is somebody who's obviously on our Facebook group. Uh, it shows you initially as Facebook user. Uh, says, good morning. I've been collecting seeds from various flowers when they are spent, but wonder if there's a rule of thumb in storage and preparation for replanting. Is it dependent on the plant type? <clears throat> for example, dahlias, blanket flower, etc. Yes, it does depend and vary a lot by the flower type. Some flowers like um, blanket flower or gyardia, which you mentioned here, each flower goes to seed and you can pull a bunch of seeds off, and if you save a bunch of them and go out there and just start throwing them out, you're going to have a bunch come up. Uh, you mentioned dahlias. Dahlias don't do well here in Central Florida. Too far south. They're more of a northern plant. They do well much further up north. Um, I know that when you collect seeds, it's usually best to put them in a paper bag because paper breathes. If you put them in a plastic baggie and there's any moisture at all, it totally traps the moisture and they might get moldy. You wanna make sure the seeds and everything else are dry before you bag them up. But if you put them in a paper bag and put them in a dry closet, any moisture is probably gonna evaporate and they're gonna become even drier over time. Some people store them in the refrigerator which you can do, but you don't have to do. A lot of plants need a certain amount of cold to kind of mimic what happens during the winter so that when they get planted in the spring, they're gonna germinate and come up. So if you're dealing with a plant that needs that cold um, blast or cold time period, you may have to deliberately put them in the fridge for a while, then try planting them. <coughs> a lot of other plants do just fine saving the seeds, put them in a paper bag, in a closet, and over time, the germination rate drops bit by bit. But I've saved tons of um, herb seeds before and planted them, and they've, oh my gosh, they just come right up. So it's a really good way to save money on seeds long-term. And Sydney points out that Pinellas County cannot fertilize from June 1st through September 30th. That is part of the Pinellas County Fertilizer Ordinance. And Hernando County has a fertilizer ordinance. Most of the counties around here have fertilizer ordinances, but they are all different. So very, very important, whatever county you live in, you find out and follow the fertilizer ordinance for your county. So for example, right now in Hernando County, we don't have a close period during the summer but we do have one during the winter. So January, February, and March, homeowners cannot fertilize in Hernando County. But in Pinellas County, they probably can. So to make things more confusing, each county in the area has a slightly different fertilizer ordinance. You always wanna kind of keep on top of that because a lot of counties do enforce that. And if you go out there and you start fertilizing your lawn, Let's say you live in Pinellas County, you go out there on June 15th, you're out there, you know, fertilizing your lawn, out there with your spreader and code enforcement drives by, you might have a problem. They might give you a ticket and every county how they enforce it is different. I really can't speak <clears throat> to the specifics of Pinellas County, 
But I know that here in Hernando County, they do enforce things like the uh, irrigation restrictions, which is what days and when you're allowed to water, what hours you're allowed to water, how often you can do it. And coming up this coming Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. here on our Facebook page, we're going to have a Facebook Live. I know we've gotten away from doing Facebook Live for a while, but we're going to get back into it. And my regular co-host, Lily Browning, is going to stop by, and we're going to talk about Fernando County irrigation restrictions. And we're going to make sure everybody understands all the different rules and restrictions involved with it, because code enforcement does enforce it, and code enforcement is probably going to start enforcing it more strictly in the future. So we want to make sure everybody understands the rules and nobody gets one of the big fat tickets because for the first for the first violation, they can give you a hundred dollar ticket and they usually do. So I don't have anything to do with that. I'm just sharing the information. I'm not uh, making the rules or enforcing them either. But that's going to be this coming Tuesday morning at 9 a.m. right here on our Facebook page. We're going to be live talking about that. Um, let's go down through the list here. Monique says, I had to remove some agapanthus and need to replant. Will they still bloom? Um, if you're talking about the agapanthus, yeah, you could transplant them. Uh, they're really pretty easy to transplant. Anytime you transplant something, especially now with the way it's been, I'm looking out the window right now and there's not a cloud in the sky. It's sunny, and I'm sure it's getting warm. So you're going to have to water it a lot every day until it gets rerooted in its new spot. But yeah, agapanthus, very, very easy to transplant. And Corey points out, um, with saving the seeds, this is true, and every plant is different. Some flowers want to be planted right away, and then other ones can be planted a year or more later. I know that for anybody who wants to try planting any wildflowers, and you can purchase um, wildflower mixtures, you have to make sure it's a mixture that's appropriate for Florida, not a mixture for Kansas or California or something, because those wildflowers aren't really going to grow and do well here. But a lot of times for wildflower seeds, you have to put them out in the fall, and then they're not going to sprout and grow until the spring. <clears throat> other things, there's lots of other ones that like to be planted in the fall and you leave them alone, they come up in the spring. Other flowers, if you like for um, Gallardia or Blanca flower or Dune Sunflower, if you collect the seeds off of them, you can plant them right away in a different flower bed in your yard and they're going to come right up and start growing in that bed. So, Or you can save the seeds for a year, plant them then. Maybe not all of them will come up, but a lot will. You can save them for a couple of years. Maybe half will come up, but that's still better than none. So it varies a lot. And Monique shares my sentiment that we need rain so bad because I have a vegetable garden in my backyard. I'm trying to put in some crotons. I just planted a lemon tree yesterday. <clears throat> and they all need water because it's not raining at all. So a little free rainfall will definitely save me time, effort, dragging the hose around the backyard, and eventually watering too much starts to make a real impact on your water bill if you're on uh, utilities department water. <clears throat> and Teresa is still watching, and she just shared a fact sheet here on Agapanthus. So uh, Monique, if you want to go ahead and click on that link, tells you all about agapanthus. I don't see an awful lot of them in people's yards, but they are very easy to grow, reliable. I don't think I've ever gotten a question from anybody who had a problem with their agapanthus. So, hey, you got to appreciate plants that you just never, ever, ever have problems with. So you don't want to be growing Arizona cypress because I get lots of emails and calls about them. They are uh, always a problem. Uh, and then Italian cypress also. 
And I know people have Italian Cypress and Arizona Cypress. And you may say, well, I have one. And it does great. It looks beautiful. I've had it for years. It grows. Never had a problem. One day, you probably will. So they can do okay if they're in the right spot, the right environment. And they'll do all right for a number of years. But it's kind of one of those ticking time bombs. One day, if you live in your house long enough, you're going to have a problem with it. And then you're going to be emailing me pictures, and I'm going to be telling you if they don't do well here. Sorry. Oh, my goodness. Cindy brought up, uh, have you seen the program in Florida about starting a unity garden? Yes. Good morning, Cindy. Um, we were involved in that. What that is, for anybody that's not familiar with it, just recently within the last week, Florida Department of Agriculture put on their social media that they are sending seeds to a bunch of different extension offices. Every extension office that has master gardeners, which is almost every office, but not quite all of them. They were sending them free vegetable seeds to hand out to the public for people to start a unity garden. I'm still not completely clear on exactly what a unity garden is. But it's a vegetable garden. So they sent us an email on Tuesday saying, we're going to send you seeds, hand them out to people, watch your mail for the seeds, period. That was about it. So they didn't give us a whole lot of information on it. Friday, the box showed up and there were seeds in there, enough seeds for 20 people, that's 20 people, to get several, of like five packs of seeds each. We put them together, stapled them together, made little bundles, had a, a, a Florida vegetable gardening guide handout to give to everybody. People came in on Monday and picked them up, and ours are all gone. And my guess is that every county has given all of theirs out by this point. <clears throat> a couple little problems with that. They didn't give us much advance notice. We had no idea how many seeds were coming. We didn't know, do we promote it? Do we not promote it? We don't want to tell everybody, hey, come by the office, get free seeds. If we can only give them out to the first 20 people, then you end up with a lot of unhappy people. And with the different seeds they gave out, and we got tomatoes. I know a couple kinds of tomatoes, and I can't remember exactly what else. We were supposed to get okra, which we didn't. We are supposed to get cucumbers, I'm pretty sure we didn't. Well, we got mostly tomato seeds that we handed out. Almost none of those different things are vegetables that you will take home and plant right now. Not the time of year for it. If you live in South Florida, not the time of year for them either. If you're buddy and you live up in North Florida, maybe, depending on exactly what things we handed out, you might be able to still squeeze them in up there. But even in North Florida, it's getting late. So almost all the seeds we handed out, we had to tell people, don't plant them right now. Read the gardening guide, wait until fall, wait until winter, wait until next spring, and go ahead and plant them then. So, yes, Cindy, we, we were involved with that. And everything went well. We had 20 people come in and get the seeds. And I don't think anybody else has come in looking for them since then. So. Um, Facebook user asked, is there a free plant identifier app that folks have used successfully? Not that I know of, but I honestly haven't really tried them. I've seen on Facebook other people who have apps. There's one through Google, I think. And what it is, is you take a picture of a plant with your phone and you go into the app and you put the picture in the app and it tells you what the plant is. It's not 100% correct, but apparently it's 80, 90, 95% correct. Some people swear by it, but there are some plants where it just it gives you a really, really wrong answer. So it's it helps, but it's not 100% accurate. Other than that, I've never tried downloading any of I need to look at that up and try downloading one and just, just play with it and see if it gives me the right answer or not. 
And Monique, I think going back to the Agapanthus here, uh, says some years they don't bloom as much, but considering where they come from, you can't water them too much. A lot of plants, a lot of flowering plants, their flowering every year is dependent on the winter weather. So some plants like a colder winter, other plants like a warmer winter. It varies plant by plant. So that's why certain things, it, you're like, oh, gosh, my hibiscus or my agapanthus, last year it bloomed great, this year not so much. What's going to happen next year? It varies, and it's a weather thing. A lot of times it's how much cold, uh, how cold it got, how long it got cold for, and it has a big impact on your plants. I know a lot of um, fruiting plants, things like blueberries, probably blackberries, peaches, plums, and nectarines are very cold weather dependent. And sometimes if we have a winter where we get a lot of cold weather, but no surprise, very, very late frosts, sometimes those plants will flower profusely and you will get a bumper crop from them. So it varies quite a bit. Um, Sid does mention iNaturalist, and this is really, really good. And I did a class on this just recently for some of the different services and places where you can get, let's say, an unknown animal, an unknown insect, or an unknown plant identified if you think it's invasive. iNaturalist is a really, really great way to submit a picture of a plant, an animal. Let's say, I like to use the example, you walk out in your backyard, and there's a lizard on your picnic table, and it's four feet long. And you're thinking, I've never seen a lizard this big in my backyard before. What the heck is this? If it's not an alligator, because alligators do belong, don't mess with the alligators. But if it's an unknown lizard, you can take a picture of it. <clears throat> you can email it to us, and we will forward it and get it identified for you. You can go through um, iNaturalist. You can go through Ed Maps. That's E D D Maps, and that's a service that's run through University of Georgia that tracks different invasive plants and insects and animals and invasive snails and fish and everything else. There's a lot of services you can send it to, and people will look at it and identify it. You always have to be careful because sometimes it gets identified by an expert researcher. And you can be pretty sure <clears throat> that that identification is correct. EdMaps, they have everything looked at and checked off and signed off on by an expert before they make it public. And they say that, aha, your county now has um, four-foot lizards because we, we've checked it and we verify that it's an invasive lizard. So they check it before they put it up. If you go onto a Facebook gardening group, and you put a picture of a plant on there and ask, what is this? You're going to get every every uh, answer imaginable. <clears throat> I guarantee if you look through all of them, one of them is correct and a bunch are probably not really correct. People will put <coughs> their, their guesses, um, their best guess on there might be correct, might not be correct. You're going to get the whole range of answers on a Facebook group. So iNaturalist is very good. <clears throat> we definitely suggest that people check that out and sign up for it if you're interested. And it really helps the um, people with the state of Florida and the researchers and the experts track different invasive organisms. So that example that I mentioned, the four-foot lizard, it may be a fully grown tegu lizard. And maybe they don't know that they're present in your county. They have been positively identified in Hernando County. But if you live uh, like Buddy up in the panhandle, if you send a picture in, the experts can go, aha, this is a Tegu lizard. Okay, what county does Buddy live in? Okay, now we know that they're present in his county. Maybe we could send a trapper out to look for it and catch it. That's a good option. Maybe we can start a public campaign warning other people that they're present. That's a good idea. The researchers, when they're tracking these things, now know that they're present in that county also. So a lot of times you're helping a lot of other people 
with, uh, and here's that link again, Teresa put it up for inaturalist.org. That is a very good, legit organization. Something else that everybody can sign up for <clears throat> is called DDIS, and that is Distance Diagnostics and Identification Service. That's a free service through University of Florida. Anybody can sign up on it. If you just go to this link right here, follow the directions for a new user, you can sign up. It takes a day or so to get approved. Then after that, I use it myself. You guys all send me pictures of different various plants and stuff that you find growing in the woods. And it's a little plant that's like this tall with a little white flower on it. And you're like, well, what, what's the name of this plant? I'm like, I don't know what that plant is. I don't know every plant in the, in the world, and I can't ID all of them off the top of my head. I use DDIS. <clears throat> I put in the description. I put in my contact information. I have an account on DDIS. I attach the pictures, and I put in, can you identify this plant? And I send it off. And Mark Frank at the University of Florida Herbarium takes care of the plant IDs for DDIS. And he'll look at it and he always knows what it is. He sends back, it's this, it's native, it's invasive, it's only found here or there. Here's a link to a fact sheet. And you know what I do? I copy and paste what he sent back to me and I send it to you. So I don't have to know everything. I just have to know people who know everything. But you can sign up. Anybody can sign up on DDIS. It's free, and we highly encourage that one also. So Lee <clears throat> has a comment on here. Uh, and Lee lives in Broward County, so it's down south, South Florida. She said her cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, and cabbage did not do so well down in Broward. It was too warm during the winter and wasn't cool enough. That happens because broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, and Brussels sprouts all grow during the winter, and they're all cool weather crops, and some of them are fussier than others. South Florida, going to be tricky, but there are um, broccoli and cabbage are the most forgiving of them. They like it cool, but they're going to be the most forgiving if you have warm temperatures during the winter. Brussels sprouts are probably the least forgiving. Buddy up in the panhandle can probably grow Brussels sprouts during most years. <clears throat> Here in Hernando County, it's less than 50% of the winters where you're going to grow really good Brussels sprouts. Uh, further north, from Georgia north, that's where you grow Brussels sprouts because they need lots of cold weather. Uh, cauliflower, kind of in between. Cauliflower is funny because if you plant cauliflower, if you start seeds and you start transplants in the fall, put the transplants in your garden, you can grow cauliflower. I've grown cauliflower before. It's great. Homegrown cauliflower is fantastic. If at any point, between when the cauliflower is just coming up and it's real small, all the way up to when you harvest it, it gets really, really warm. And you know, in winters, sometimes you'll have like for a couple, for a week, temperature goes back up in the 80s, 85, then it drops, then we get a freeze and it gets really warm again. Cauliflower hates that. If cauliflower gets too hot a temperatures for even a couple days at any point in its life, it will not make a nice big head of cauliflower. It'll make a smaller head or smaller head, or it will do something that they call buttoning. And it will make a head of cauliflower that's about the size of a quarter, maybe 50, 50 cent piece. And that's all you get. So cauliflower needs a cool. If you try growing cauliflower and it happens to be a cold winter, that is going to be your lucky winter for cauliflower. So you're probably going to do well with cauliflower. You may even do well with Brussels sprouts. But broccoli is more forgiving, and cabbage is probably the most forgiving. Cabbage, I mean, you can't grow cabbage during the heat of summer, but most anybody, I'm not sure how far south they grow it commercially. I would think Broward County, you can grow cabbage down there. I know 
Broward County and interior Florida, they grow tens of thousands of acres of romaine lettuce and celery and things like that in the winter, only during the winter down there. So, Lee, you could do like I do. I try cauliflower most every year. I'm not brave enough to try Brussels sprouts. I try cabbage. And every time I grow broccoli and actually put some time and effort into it, I'm rewarded with a huge harvest of broccoli. So I know not everybody likes broccoli. I don't know why I love it. Try growing broccoli this winter. That's that's the thought for today. Yeah, and Lee said in years past she had no problem. This season was too hot. That happens. It varies. We have warmer winters. We have colder winters sometimes. And those are the years where you think, like, gosh, my Brussels sprouts and cabbage and broccoli did great. My plum tree flowered like crazy, and I got a huge crop off of it. It's that winter weather, and, you know, we can't predict it. It varies. Every 30 years, we have a record hot winter or a record cold winter. Every year, it's pretty much roll of the dice. So let me double check one more thing here. Oh. Here we go. We will answer one more question here live online. And it's a picture that Teresa sent me. And let's go ahead and get that shared here. And here we go, Teresa. I think is wondering what the heck this is. And I know what this is right off the top of my head. Those are aphids. And I could tell by the shape of the head, shape of the body. It's really difficult to see in this picture. I'm looking at all the aphid butts, basically. So see, this week we cover poo out in your yard and aphid butts also but if you look at an aphid with a magnifying glass or hand lens or under a microscope if you look at their rear end they have two little structures that look like little tailpipes so if you can kind of picture an aphid as like a little race car and on its back end it has two little tailpipes sticking out that's that's completely distinctive of an aphid but these look like aphids and there's a lot of them there's adults, there's immatures, whatever plant that is growing on insecticidal soap sprayed probably more than once, maybe just once, but you might have to follow up a few more times, will take care of the problem. So that's an easy solve. There are a lot of much harsher insecticides out there that kill aphids just fine. The problem is they're going to kill too much in your yard. So you always want to start with the least toxic, safest to use, effective pest control. And insecticidal soap will take care of them. If you have aphids and they're only on one or two leaves and you don't have many, if you take your garden hose and just lightly spray that leaf, you can blow them off <coughs> and they're gone. They're not going to come back. Problem solved. That is the easiest way to solve an aphid problem. Aphids are only a huge problem if you let them go and go and go. And now you have your plants covered with millions of aphids. At that point, they're hard to get under control. So if you check your plants frequently, know what basic pests look like. Aphids have little tailpipes. Other things look fairly distinctive. If you don't know what they are, Email them to me. Email them. If you send me a picture like what Teresa sent, that is a great picture. I can figure out exactly what that is right away and tell you and send you information on what to do to control them. So get your insect identified. For most things, insecticidal soap, neem oil. Neem oil is real hit or miss. I'm not a huge fan of neem oil, but a lot of times it works pretty well. Horticultural oil spray. 
but you can't use that during the summer when it's really sunny and hot. And it's getting pretty close to summer now. Um, and if you have a caterpillar problem, get BT. BT kills caterpillars and nothing else. And if you have a problem with larger things like fully grown stink bugs, leaf footed bugs, beetles, if you get um, pyrethrin, not pyrethroids, but pyrethrin, and there's a product that you can order online, uh, Pyganic, I think, that's all you need. If you have those things in your toolbox, you're going to fix not and control 99% of your insect problems, and you're not going to poison your entire yard or neighborhood or your dogs or the neighbor's dogs or the neighbor's and you're going to actually solve your problem and accomplish your goals because that's what we're trying to do here is help you accomplish your goals so i think on that that's a perfect note to end this on today thank you so much for everybody for joining just me uh, i think next week we have lily back here with us or I need to look around for a couple more uh, guests. It's always fun to have guests on here. I know that every guest I've ever had on here enjoys it because of all the engagement, all the questions you guys ask. So be sure to tune in again next Thursday at 10 p.m. or 10 a.m. I can assure you that there will be somebody here. Not sure exactly who, but we'll have somebody and we'll see you then. So until then, thanks again and have a great week. Bye.